Good morning, and welcome to episode four of Spooky Spice's Morning Latte. This time, I'm not alone, and I'm actually joined by some friends of mine. We're going to start friends with is a strong word. <laughs> friends is a strong word. We're going to start with the newest streamer, Thought Caesar, who has been streaming Borderlands and some nice indie games. He's got a lumberjack face and a lumberjack attitude, and some nice jokes to go with it. Hi, Scott. Hello. And then we have Mosgro, who plays Dark Souls, feeds and smite. And rants on the internet. How are you, Moscrow? Hello. <laughs> <laughs> and then we have Victoria who tweets. Sorry, I'm tweeting. Can you repeat that? And we have Victoria who tweets. Yes, that's right. <laughs> Last time on episode three, I went really in depth about single player versus multiplayer games. And at one point, I kind of got into a little bit of a rant about my favorite game. So that gave me the idea of talking about some of our favorite games with a few of my friends. In that, I made it very clear my favorite game of all time was um, Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic, the first one, because, I mean, I didn't shut up about it the entire time. So I'm going to pose a question starting with uh, you, Scott. What's your favorite game of all time? My favorite game of all time, I I suppose the game I've probably had the most fun with over the years has got to be Diablo 3. I think I've bought this game three different times on three different consoles, mm-hmm. and I just couldn't, it's never a bad game choice whenever you're looking for something to play yeah i played a I played a little bit of it on 360 and i didn't have i didn't play with many friends at the time because a lot of my friends moved on to playstation 4 by the time i bought diablo 3 mm-hmm. but the little bit of time i spent with it was really fun it's really i was surprised at it being an over-the-top view kind of game how i don't know it's hard to explain it felt very it felt very witcher and very oblivion but it was over the top and it was cartoony almost but it just did a really good job of blending the two for me it was it was really strange for me i remember when i first got it i was at a steak and shake with a co-worker at the time that uh he actually just introduced me to magic the gathering and we kind of mm-hmm. bonded over that and then it turned out we both had xbox 360s you know and all right. this other stuff and he mentioned that uh diablo 3 his roommate had been playing it on pc and he had bought it for pc too but it was coming out for 360 and, I mean, at the time, I was broke. I was in college, but I'd had a GameStop uh, membership for countless years at this point. And I decided, you know, I'd just check my balance, see how many points I had, and whether I could redeem it for anything. Mm-hmm. And I ended up having just enough to actually redeem it for Diablo 3. And, I mean, at this point, it was a free game, and I didn't even, you know, hadn't even considered that I had the points at the time. So, right. you know, I, I went out and got it, and I was, you know, it was just going to be something for me and my buddy to play, and it just turned into this overwhelming experience to me it was just so much fun and you could always you know we started on the hardest difficulty Jesus that's just the kind of grinders we were back then on these games and uh it was incredible and I loved it and I think I can't remember what happened to the first copy I had but I remember buying it again for digital download on my Xbox 360 years later and playing it then again and as soon as I got a PlayStation 4 I actually actually ended up living with my friend and uh He bought it, so I bought it as well. And, you know, the grind just continues. And I still, to this day, find him online and we'll both play it. And, like, another shared love we had is Blink-182. And it's like, you know, our, our little thing is that it's not always your first choice, but it's always a great choice. You're always in the mood for Diablo. You just don't realize it at the time until you put it in and you start playing again. And you realize, like, just everything you've been doing and how much fun this game can be. I like to imagine Scott in a mood to play Diablo 3, and he sees his friends online, he sends a message of uh, Blink-182 lyrics, he goes, Where are you? <laughs> and the crazy thing is, like that that's kind of like our thing, we'll, we randomly do, like, send messages and texts oh, and really? whatnot of Blink-182 lyrics. <laughs> and like, so yeah, I mean, it fits. Like, I feel like just, a lot of the time, great. I feel like a lot of the time, your favorite game will be, it's either going to be a game where you were just by yourself and you really dove into the game and got completely immersed in it and what's in the lore of it and what's going on in the game or it's a game where you either met a friend or had a friend and you both grinded it and you both got obsessed with it that way like how uh like how, I, I mean i met moscow through smite and at the time i loved smite it was my favorite game i had a genuine love for it i didn't hate it like i do now <laughs> and uh it's funny because i i met him through our other friends at first, I was like, oh my god, this guy's so good at this game. I'm so bad compared to him. He has a diamond what, Hades, me? and I build Polynomicon Ymir. What do I gotta do to be better than this guy? <laughs> oh god. 
that's funny how that changed real quick, didn't it? <laughs> and uh, <laughs> as I started to grind the game more, I had more friends that played it, blah, blah, blah. It's just crazy to me how it's really either one of the two. Like, going back to what mine was, KOTOR was a s- single-player game, and it was on the original Xbox. So, I mean, the chances of me even finding somebody in my my homeschool district I had that even played that game <laughs> was, like, negative, I don't know, million? <laughs> <laughs> but um, everything about the game just enticed me. But it, Like I said, it was all single-player, but I never got to experience, you know, somebody else having a shared love for the game, so it's really cool that he got to have somebody that loved the game equally as much as you. Definitely. And I, I remember him when he introduced me to the idea, just the thought of getting Diablo 3. Like, he's just egging me on. Like, man, you're going to love this game. You'll love it. It's so much fun. There's, like, you know, not so much that there's so much to do, but mm-hmm. at the same time, there is so much to do. And, you know, right. and I, I was I was on the fence for the longest time till I realized that it wouldn't cost me anything. So, you know, what in the world? I might as well give it a shot. So yeah. here I am, you know, however many years later since it's been dropped on console and, you know, I've done everything I possibly can in the game. It's just, it's awesome. And I'm, you know, really thankful that, you know, it just took a little mm-hmm. chat at Steak and Shake to get me to <laughs> pick this game up. So then before we move on, I have to ask you, since I, I think it recently just got, it was either a rumor or it actually got confirmed. I'm not entirely sure. How do you feel about Diablo 4? I mean, I'm... What I've read and heard from Diablo 4 is that they're kind of going with more of an MMO experience. You know, I, I haven't read a whole lot. I've, I've read a couple threads here and there. I haven't followed it, you know, nearly as religiously as perhaps I should have. Right now, mm-hmm. I've been on, like you said, a Borderlands kick. So I've been looking into Borderlands 3 nonstop. Mm-hmm. And uh, as far as, like, an MMO Diablo, I'm excited for it, but I'm nervous at the same time. Like, that's a, that's a really interesting direction for any game to go, especially when it's always been kind of like a, you know, four population in your party max kind of game. Right. And for them to, you know, want to suddenly go in MMO direction, it makes me a little hesitant. I mean, I'll obviously get it, and I'm sure I'll love it, but at the same time, it's going to be completely different. And especially considering, like, the history that they've had with these, like, mass online endeavors yeah. oh, with yeah. Diablo. Like the shop and auctions and all this other stuff and the feedback that the community has given them in the past, you know. Hopefully they've learned from it. I mean, I'm more than oh yeah. At least if nothing else, at least if nothing else, Blizzard is definitely reliable as a developer publisher. Yeah. So I'm, and you know, Diablo's got you know such a strong fan base. I mean, these guys are incredibly religious. I mean, it's like almost akin to the old grinders of Age of Empires of yesteryear where you know they wait 17 years for a dlc kind of a deal i mean they still there's still servers run for the original diablos they're yeah. still played every single yeah. day which is insane to me i can't think of many games that are like that yeah and it's just it's the captivating like rng of the game the the fact that you can play through the game yeah. a thousand times and never once have the same experience genuinely where yeah. like you know a lot of games they'll say you know yeah, you can play these levels, you know, again and again and again, and it's always going to be different, but the differences are, like, minute. And with this, like, you know, there are dungeons that I still, to this day, haven't been able to find on one single account. Oh, wow. And actually complete the entire game, because some of them are so hard to get, and, you know... That's crazy. There's just so much, like I said, RNG. Like, you know, the percentages just keep the game interesting constantly. How about you, Mr. Alabama? Have you ever played Diablo 3? Nope. Really? I'm surprised by that. I would expect you to like get that game on a sale or something and then dive into it. It seems like your kind of game. I thought about it for a while, but I decided not to. Hmm. You, you should. Like, the game, if you, get, Mozzie, if you got it, I guarantee you I would be there 100% <laughs> constantly playing it with you. And, like, the game is just incredible. Like I said, you, it's so different every time that I couldn't possibly get bored playing that game because it's not going to be something I've in- experienced previously. I feel like you could draw, I mean, not many, but I feel like there's some similarities that could be drawn to Dark Souls too. I would say maybe lore, not so much gameplay, obviously. I would say lore and aesthetic of it. The lore is like, I don't actually know much about the lore of... The oh, I, don't, I don't mean so much it. that you could draw direct similarities between Diablo story and Dark Souls story, more so the death of it and how much there is yeah, to it and the way I that can... it's presented to you throughout the game. I think they're similar. I, I could see similar themes occurring between the two games. Because in neither game, there's hand-holding and, you know, direct. There's very few cutscenes. There's not, like, you know, this is a story, this is your this is your hero, this is your... It's not like that in either game, I feel like. 
The no. main reason I'd be interested in playing Diablo is, like, they, you know they released a new class, the Lich class. Well, not Lich, but the Necromancer, Necromancer class. That one interests me greatly. Mm-hmm. That would be the reason I'd want to play the game. It's the Necromancer I've played. You know, I've had a lot of fun. That's my current character. I mean, I have every character max level, max paragon through <laughs> through the max paragons through accidentally playing online and getting into lobbies with people with modded gear. Uh, it just gives you like trillions of experience every time they kill something. So that was an accident. Um, but and you know, if I play with somebody and their paragon levels like twelve hundred or something instead of ten thousand. <laughs> I'll drop my Paragon level down and, you know, spec it so it's an even battle. I'm not going to walk in there and just carry everybody through it, because Diablo is one of those games where if you have somebody power leveling you, it does lose a lot of merit and fun. So, you know, and while there are harder and harder difficulties, at the same time, like, there's a there, there could be a point where if someone has a new character and I have one of mine, that I will be having a good fight the entire time, but they'll be dying instantly. So... Yeah, I feel like that's the only issue with games of that type is that it can be hard for, uh, I would say, I don't want to say OP, but, you know, god-tier players to help their friends through stuff because of how the game balances out dungeons and stuff. You you would definitely have to start a new character if I was, for instance, going to play with Mosker. Right. Like, that's just... But at the same time, I don't mind. Like, you know, I start new characters all the time, and... Another great thing that this game's done is so that I can go back to my, you know, mains, if you will. They have seasonal um, quests and things now and leaderboards and all this other stuff where you can compare your scores with friends in the world and whatnot. And mm-hmm. I actually believe the season just ended last week, so I might end up hopping back on that and starting to pick up my scores again. But, you know, it, it keeps it fresh, especially for, you know, if you look at Diablo and how long it takes for them to release a new title in between each and every one i mean it is you know i don't remember if it was like eight ten years somewhere in there between diablo 2 and diablo 3 but when you get the game and you're playing the game you you realize how worth it it was along the lines of like the witcher series where it was forever between two and three but when they released three like you fell in love with cd project red here's a challenge for you before we move on of the three of us or excuse me four of us well, the reason I said three of us is because three of us here are ridiculously grindy gamers with neck beard and armpit sweat, <laughs> and and you're definitely a casual player. I mean, you said that yourself in uh, the la- the one we did together. Mm-hmm. So my challenge to you, Scott, is from a, if you were if you were a not we'll say non GameStop employee because I mean they can't really be honest and most of them don't know anything about games anyway. Mm-hmm. If, if you had to sell Diablo three to Victoria. Who's a casual, chill gamer to get who, who, but you think she would like it? What would you say to her? Ooh, so I have to convince her to. Oh, yeah, that's, if, like, if, you, it's, if you had it's to give very... her, yeah, if you had to give her a sell, not necessarily convince her, but you know, if you had to just give a sell on it to a more laid back person, gaming wise. Oh, it's it's a very laid back game, and maybe that's another like thing that I love about the game is that it is incredibly laid back. There's no, you're never, you know getting upset or mad or you know i guess at the pinnacle the very top 0.1 percent players they might get upset with each other because they've been grinding the same characters for years and they're trying to just finally beat everything in the game but like if you just want to play through have a lot of fun with a group of friends and stuff like the game has the settings where you can have if you just want to show up with a bunch of friends and kill tons of things like oh by all means you could do it if you want the story i mean Granted, the story is a lot of fun, but you can. It's really easy to just kind of not care about the story with all the action that's going on in Diablo. Um, you know, if you want the story, you can pay attention to all the lore and read all the books and talk to all the people. And I mean, the cutscenes are absolutely fantastic. You really need to look them up if you haven't seen any of the cutscenes yeah. from Diablo Three. They are absolutely perfect. Yeah, they have a lot of Blizzard's uh, CGI work too, and it's just... <laughs> they're gorgeous, like very lifelike, very perfect. Um, All right, I'm sold. Where's my keys? That's yeah, I'm place. telling you, just go get it. It's <laughs> it's so much fun. You the ways you can build your each character. Like I have two separate monks, and one's built as a tank that taunts and heals and everything, and the other one's just a straight up bruiser who walks into the room and kills everything and then runs out. Like it's it's 
fantastic. It's so much fun to play. And it's just, yeah, like I said, it's good fun with friends. I mean, that's the number one thing about, you know, multiplayer online is having fun with friends. And this game is just, there is there is kind of PvP, but it's really not yeah, anything not at all. Like, it, I honestly was going, I was, I stopped myself because I was going to say it's straight up PvE. And then remember, there is a PvP element to it, but like, it's not worth mentioning, to be entirely honest with you. Like, the game is, it's a ton of fun. It doesn't get old. Like I said, every game's different. You know, you up the difficulty, drop the difficulty, pay attention to the lore, just show up and kill everything. Like, whatever you want to do, like, Diablo has it for you. And the controls are very easy. You know, there's yeah. no, like, combos. And it's probably combos. really good for a person like you too, Vic, where you have a, where you get vertigo occasionally with games because it's an over-the-top view, kind of like League of Legends. Yeah. So it's really the fixed camera. It's, it's over-the-top at all times. Like you can't you can't change your camera pitch at all, which sounds really you know frustrating on the surface. But once you play the game, you realize that this fixed over the top view, like everything's occurring in your screen, and the game makes up for it by like if you're gonna right. walk past a wall or a pillar, it just makes the wall or pillar or whatnot transparent. So at all times you can see. You don't have to worry about like the camera swinging around on you, you know, or anything like that. It's the game. It just caters to everyone except for maybe children yeah all right moscrow you've been sitting there nice and patient listening to diablo i'm pretty i feel like i know what your game is but you could surprise me so, yeah i'm not surprised <laughs> okay, okay so i've been sitting here looking at this wood stick this entire time did you say a wooden stick i have a wooden staff in my room oh is is it in relation to your favorite game Oh, I'm I'm upset. That would have been so. That would have been such a good segue. I'm upset. I I was just about to chime in that we need to keep this PG. So before we (laughs) start talking about what's in our rooms, wait, wait, calm down. Yeah, the lumberjack. I have a nice long. (laughs) Scott puts his chainsaw behind his back. And there, (laughs) and there it goes. (laughs) All right, Monster. What's your favorite? What's your favorite? Man holding his. Nothing wrong with a man holding his piece of wood. Anyway, Moscow, so what's your but favorite anyhow, game? Surprise, surprise. My favorite game. This is my... <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what you're thinking about. I like Smite, but it would have to actually be Dark Souls 2. Dark Souls is very important to me for a lot of different reasons, but one of them is I feel like it is the perfect <laughs> epic story. As in, when I say epic, you know, say... The Odyssey, that's mm-hmm. an epic. Dark Souls itself is an epic that you make. Hmm, that's a good comparison. Because every time you start the game, you usually start as some, literally just some guy, just either sitting in a cell, coming to some strange place, you're more or less a zombie, mm-hmm. and your first thing that you learn is you are weak to everything around you. Everything around you can kill you, yet you will rise up, you will start to kill, you know, these regular other guys that are just there. Regular undead. You will grow in strength, and then you'll start to take on the legends of that world. It is you versus the world, more or less. Story of my life. <laughs> There's something so perfect about that. Oh, yeah, totally. I, I would definitely agree that Dark Souls is one of the... How movies have, you know, the Lord of the Rings, they have... Um... Troy, things like that. I would definitely say Dark Souls is one of the epics of gaming. One thing that your character goes through is you go through something called being an undead. Being an undead means you cannot die. It is a curse to not die. Oh, have you dude, ever that's heard... That's worst nightmare. But I'm sure, you know, Macbeth, have you heard the... Uh, what is it? I suppose it's a poem, but the speech to be or not to be. That is the question. Actually, that's in Hamlet, uh, not Macbeth. Oh, f- oh, I just feel like I got... You know what I'm talking about. The point is... <laughs> Continue, Musk. ...that the reason not being able to die is such an issue is because, all right, the big theme in the game is light versus dark and vice versa. In the game, you're supposed to try and link the fire mm-hmm. so you can keep things going the way they are. And, of course, it's, you know, light. It's wonderful. It leads to everything you see around you. However... In a way, darkness itself is quiet and calm, correct? Correct. Being alive might perhaps be more torturous than it is to be dead. 
<laughs> that's that's the new title of this podcast. Being alive is more torturous than being dead. Starting well, I mean, Mosgro. Like, for example, in the second game, you start out going to some strange place because you start losing who you are. And you just go through the game, mm-hmm. and you go to places that no one else in the, in the game world can get to. You start from nothing, and you become the strongest, and nothing can stop you. It's amazing. You managed to meet some... Some better of your friends through that game too, didn't you? Didn't you meet like a like I meet basically, met basically everyone I talked to on PSN. Oh, really? It all started when I met one saucy boy <laughs> playing Bloodborne. When I was playing Bloodborne, I made a blood tinge build, which is the best class for PvP in that game, and I kicked mm-hmm. the crap out of the Sam Ham Clam. Okay. <laughs> and oh, in it... fact, I beat him so bad. Uh-huh. I felt bad for him, and I asked him if he wanted help to get through the level. <laughs> oh, my God. Now, one reason he did so awful is because he was like, the build he was doing was just, it's very strange. It doesn't work very well. Uh-huh. So, when it, like, so just picture this. So, uh, I sent him this message. He sends me a party invite. Now, usually, at this point, I would never accept a party invite. I hated talking to people. Yeah. Totally. So, what I did... I joined the party invite, and, like, I had my mic with me, but I told him I, oh, I did, lost did you know it. Was that, oh, my mic doesn't work, dude. Sorry. No, I just said I lost it, so basically, yeah. <laughs> so, so I just sit there in the party alone, and it's 1230 at night. Where he was, it was, like, 130 or something. We played for about two hours. Sam would not shut up this entire time. <laughs> Like, he was just going and going and going and ranting and raving about all sorts of different things. He sounded like he was drunk the entire time. <laughs> and it was the funniest thing ever. And I, I was just sitting it. there, and any time I wanted to say anything to him, I would type him up in PSN, like, these long paragraphs. Like, I'm sure you really, you know how much when I typed something. Right. Like, a type of freaking essay. So we went back and forth, back and forth. Eventually, finished the session or whatever. I just kept talking to him more. We, I got Bloodborne, or we finished Bloodborne. We played that a while. We played Dark Souls 2. Then I met his brother, mm-hmm. Alex. Yeah, and then real, Alex gave me real nice guy. a beta code. Uh, oh, yeah, definitely. But he gave me a beta code to smite so I could play the beta. Oh, my God. <laughs> That's where I got my beta code, too. <laughs> so then I met you. I met Scott. And you met And I met... Unfortunately, yes. We met in a dark time. (laughs) (laughs) I just imagine Monster as Obi-Wan. Before the dark times. Oh, you mean when you were playing Smite? (laughs) No. When I met Victoria. Would you say that you also had a dark soul during this dark time? We're gonna end this here. Thanks for hanging out. (laughs) (laughs) Victoria talk! Time to end it. That's one reason why it's special to me, is I met a lot of people that, a lot of nice people that I really like to hang out with. And there's also the fact, very strange, the way they have their multiplayer set up, you just mm-hmm. basically come in, you help the person, and you leave. Right? Right. There is no voice chat in the game, actually. As in, you cannot just talk to people oh, while you're so there. Oh, so if you, like, invade somebody, you can't spam with the, ha, you just got wrecked, noob! Oh, no. No. Definitely not. Well, that's good. Actually, that comes back to... The creator of the game, Miyazaki, apparently, the reason why he made it this way Uh was that he was once, obviously, he lives in Japan. Oh, really? It sounds like a straight-up Alabama name. My name's Miyazaki, and I ride tractors for a living. But, so he was in a a snowstorm. It it wasn't sure if he'd be able to get through it over this hill. Right. What happened was, there was a bunch of people that was having this problem. So they're all sitting in their cars, and they would bump each other up the hill. There was one guy that was at the back of it, and no one was quite sure what happened to him. He wanted to capture this idea of meeting strangers who would help you out when you needed it the most. Or strangers that will fuck you over when they invade your world. Now, did you um, did you play Demon Souls? Yes, but I, was gonna say, I it have sounds never like finished that game. Really? Nope. I find that really surprising, because you were a PlayStation faithful, right? PS2, PS3, everything? The first one I played was Dark Souls 2. Oh. Then I I went back, I played Dark Souls 1, then I played Bloodborne, and then Dark Souls 3. I do actually currently have Demon's Souls. I've never finished it. 
played it for about three hours. Right. And that game is the hardest thing I have ever. Yeah, I tried. remember. Uh, I forget where I used to watch this, but before I was super hardcore into multiplayer games, I only played single player games. And a lot of times when I'd be grinding through the games, I'd put on background noise of like, you know, old GameSpot, old IGN, uh, Inside Gaming Daily, that kind of stuff. And I remember one time they were talking about Dark Souls coming out, and I forget what channel it was that was talking about this. And they were saying that it was dumbed down from Demon Souls. So it, when I played the original Dark Souls, I, I didn't beat it. I didn't get very far in it because I got it towards the end of my of me owning a 360. But I remember I died so many times that I couldn't help but think about, like, if this game was slightly dumbed down from the original, then how... And oh, how could original. anybody possibly beat the original game? <laughs> like, the original is the kind of game that it'll kick you to the ground while you're crying and then start stepping on you, pushing your face in the mud, and it'll tell you to eat it. Sounds like my relationship it's, with Smite at the it's moment. It's, like, awful. But I'm actually considering playing through it at some point, trying to maybe make a series out of it. Oh, that's that's a pretty good idea, actually. I could I could get with that because I've always wondered what that game. I've never looked up a lot of gameplay on that because it's not you know I've never been super interested in those games until recently. So I, I don't know. I've never looked up Demon Souls though, but I I'd like to watch a series about that. Again, that game is very strange. Like the game has, for example, items were a lot stronger in that game. Mm-hmm. For example, one thing people would do apparently there's this thing called a scraping. If it were to touch someone's armor or weapons once or twice, it'll break them. It'll break everything you had. Oh my god. What people would do is they would get that weapon, they would intentionally break it so it did no damage. What they do is they'd go to other players, invade them, and break all their gear. Then they would take this thing called the Plague Knife. It would infect you with a status ailment called Plague, which would rapidly deplete your health. They would take a broken version of that as well, and they'd leave you with broken gear and with the Plague. It's pretty hardcore. watch you. Alright, Mosscroft, I present to you the same challenge. And this is going to be a lot harder because Dark Souls is by is nowhere near a casual game. <laughs> no, no uh, I disagree. Dark Souls is a casual game. Alright, well then here's your, the same challenge I gave Scott. Sell this game to our local neighborhood casual, Victoria. Hi, that's me. You like fantasy settings, don't you? Okay. The one thing I can tell you is this. Not only is it fantasy, a fantasy setting, what I've seen of Anthony, you could probably beat his scrub <laughs> who hasn't even he took five hours on the first boss. <laughs> Shameless self-plug for Monday's Blind Dark Souls playthroughs. So it's like a challenge. <laughs> Ooh, I, that, yeah. That's a, good, now I, that's a series I would watch. <laughs> I can guarantee you Dark Souls is not as hard as most people. Very, very, very easy as a matter of fact. You just have to learn how to play it. You have to not be greedy. Raise his hand. <laughs> I can use the script you made for Anthony, though. That'd be much appreciated since Anthony didn't use it! I read it! I've read it! Oh, he has. I, oh, I have. I'm telling you, that game is... I do feel like it is honestly a perfect game, to be honest. There is oh, not wow. really anything negative I can think about. When it. you say perfect game, are you referring to Dark Souls 2 in particular, or the series as a whole? Mostly the series, with a few exceptions. L- like what? There's a boss in the first game. Well, I can't speak for Demon Souls because I haven't beat the thing. Mm-hmm. The first game was actually rushed out of development. Oh, I did, I did not know that. One of the uh, areas in the game is very clearly unfinished. It doesn't have any of the marks that the other areas in the game have. It doesn't feel like it's very well-rounded and has a very like a lot of odd enemies that were basically click and drop into it. Hmm. Like A lot of enemies will have like strategic places they're placed. Yeah. In this area, you can, you can see everyone coming from a mile away, and it's just paste-copied versions of the of previous bosses. Oh. That is the only negative part of Dark Souls, and the boss of that area is the worst in the entire series. It's okay, but it's very gimmicky. What it does, it just knock you off ledges the entire time. It does nothing else. In fact, you can beat it in three hits. The issue, though, is... What it has is it's a giant tree thing, and what it does, like, I don't want to spoil it too much, but you have to go hit on either side of it, which will cause parts of the floor to fall out, and it'll just sweep you off to the floor, or off, and just fall down and die. Right. It's just awful. Other than that, the rest of the series is, I would say, 
I have no fault with it. That was one of the better cells you've given me that actually makes me want to go play it some. So, kudos to you for that. Made you a whole fucking guy. Did that didn't make you want to go play it? <laughs> the memes made me want to play it. <laughs> so, the meme dream is strong with Dark Souls. On a topic of things that were unfinished, one of the reasons that the sequel to um, Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic is not one of my favorite games, because the game itself is great, just like the first one, but it was unfinished. The developer rushed the game out, and it was it was kind of similar to uh, Fallout 3 and Fallout New Vegas in the sense that Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic 1 was made by Bioware. They made games like Mass Effect, um, Dragon Age, things like that. They passed off the sequel with the same engine to Obsidian. Same exact situation as Fallout 3 from Bethesda to Obsidian for Fallout New Vegas. In terms of fan love, I would almost say fans love the second one more. Because the second one, I would almost say, has a story for adults, while the first one has a story for kids. The second one dives more into the gray area of things. Not just, you know, gray Jedi in the Star Wars universe, but really the gray moral area. One of the one of my favorite quests in the whole game is one you can't avoid. It's when you land on a planet called um, Nar Shadda, and a homeless person comes up to you, a beggar, and they ask for money. And you, you only get three choices. You can tell them to go die, basically, which is, you know, clearly dark side. Or give them money for food, or deny them money for food. If you give him money for food, your mentor in the game, Kraya, talks to you, and the guy runs off, and he gets mugged and killed for the money. But if you deny him food, he runs away from you, upset, because you have to threaten him to get him away from you because he nags you on about it. And then you watch him die of starvation. But either way, you watch him die. And it's the good choice and the bad choice that lead to this decision. And if that game hadn't been rushed out, and I mean, there's a mod on the PC version that restores, I think, like, over 20 hours to the game that were unfinished but left in the code. If that game had released with that stuff, honestly, I think people would talk about Star Wars Knights of the Republic 2, The Sith Lords, way more than KOTOR 1. Almost an astronomical difference. It's actually funny, but the second yeah. Dark Souls was actually, like, so what happened was, is whenever Demon Souls was made, it was actually in progress before Miyazaki. Yeah, he got a hold of it. He changed a bunch of stuff before it released became a big success. He made Dark Souls One, which became obviously a very large success. But then Dark Souls Two came out, and it was not headed by Miyazaki. People in the community make jokes about it, saying it was B Team that made Dark Souls Two, because what he was doing is Miyazaki was making Bloodborne all the way. Like, he had it in the works, I want to say, a year or two after the first Dark Souls. And it was released... Do you remember when Dark Souls 1 was released? It was like 2010 or 11. Yeah, it was 2010 or 11. I'm not entirely sure which. Dark Souls 2 was released in like 2013 or 14. Bloodborne was released in 2016, I believe. Point is, Dark Souls 2 is vastly different from the other games in a lot of different ways. And that's what makes like, it your, your favorite? No, the, uh, I... I like Dark Souls 2 because it was my first Dark Souls game, ah, okay. but it's not my favorite. My favorite is Dark Souls 3, to be honest. Like, I sometimes flip-flop off of that, but Dark Souls 2 I was going to say, I think, you, I think you backtracked a little. <laughs> like, I, I think I said Dark Souls 2 is my favorite yeah, at you the did. beginning, but uh, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> but Dark Souls 2 is very different from the other ones because it was made by different people. Basically, you would not understand anything of what was happening in Dark Souls 2 unless you played the first one. The themes it had were very different from the main story right. of the first yeah, one. Yeah, that makes it hard to get into a game. Especially like, if you jump into the sequel of a game and it doesn't do a good job of picking up where... Or it does a good job of picking up where things left off, but it doesn't do a good job of introducing a new player to the current experience. It didn't do anything with the overarching story for Dark Souls 1. It really did not move anything anywhere. Like, the first game was about you have to go link this fire thing. So everything goes on the way it is. Dark Souls 2, that is a large part of the story, and that's the end goal of the game. Mm -hmm. However, it more describes how this is an endless cycle that you can't quit. There is no real solution to this, to the whole linking the fire thing. Mm -hmm. It also deals very heavily with the idea of basically despair over the situation you find yourself in. There's really not a lot of hope. 
Like in the first game, funnily enough, this like I mentioned earlier about being undead, you can't die. There were some people or some NPCs in the game that were excited to be undead. You know, they're like, I can use this to accomplish Literally my dreams and me, everything. Though. <laughs> the problem with being undead is every time you die, you slowly hollow. What that means is you lose who you are. You become mindless, a husk, and you look like a zombie. The issue is, is okay, so if you are an undead, the only thing that will move you forward is if you have a reason to keep moving forward. The only thing that will keep you sane is if you have a goal to achieve. There comes an issue. It really, usually if someone accomplishes their goals or something, they're like, you know, it's all happy. You know, a good journey's come to an end. It's all happy. You go to heaven. Everything's great, right? Well, if you accomplish your goal and you are undead, you will lose your will to fight. What that means is, is instead of this happy ending as it's supposed to be, you lose everything once you attain what you wanted. That's really dark, but I guess that makes sense for, you know, Dark Souls. <laughs> so, say you're playing the game and you quit. The game has an explanation as to what happens when you quit. If you quit playing the game, that means you've become hollow. You've lost your will to fight. In the first <laughs> game, again, all these people are so excited about it, but then they start realizing, well... Like, to give you an example, there's a guy called Solaire in the first game. Everybody loves Solaire. The reason why is because everyone before this that you meet is either crazy or trying to kill you, other than this one guy who's just sitting there, sad. He's right. called the crestfallen warrior. You meet Solaire, and he is the most happiest person you could ever possibly meet. <laughs> and he's like, you know, I'm so happy to be undead, I can finally find my own son. That doesn't work out so great. Ah. Uh, so they're really, they really do a great job of keeping everything in the morally gray. Yes, it's like, the way you make NPCs survive in that game is you sabotage them achieving their goals. Oh, wow. Like, you literally, like, you will step in their way and make sure they can't accomplish what they want to accomplish. Because, That's like, a really there's one guy. That's for a game to take. Yeah, like, there's a dude named Thigmire. He's called the Onion Knight. You save him from all sorts of situations. Mm -hmm. Well, to be quite honest, he's not the smartest character. But he's, you know, he has a lot of heart. He's very happy to be, you know, going along. And you save him every time. It comes to a point where he wants to save you, but if you let him save you, he just dies. And then <laughs> next time you see him, since he's undead, he can't die. You'll meet him, and then he'll be hostile because he's lost his mind. However, if you stop him from saving you, he'll, he'll, like, he'll be upset with you. He's, you know, you denied him what he wanted, but he'll just go back to being normal. I feel like that's a really good summary of, a. Uh... Of Dark Souls as a series is that quest from what you just described, honestly. The game is contradictory, or it has contradictory themes, like light is wonderful, right? Mm -hmm. But with light, it brings all kinds of negative things as well. You can't have all good without having all bad. That's a good way of putting it. I think that's a good way to, to wrap up your feelings about Dark Souls. That's a really good sentiment to end with, actually. I like that. What I wanted to do for the last little part of this, just for some fun, is to talk about our most hated games <laughs> we all have come across a game we hate i mean my current most hated game is smite it's no secret i had no idea my my actual most hated game of all time and there's a reason behind it not just blind hate is two worlds two two worlds two what is that it's it, it was an it was a wannabe <laughs> oblivion and here's why <laughs> so when i was I forget when the game came out, but I bought the game when I was probably, like, 13, 14. So I was kind of naive in buying it. But I just, it was cheap, and I had a couple extra bucks, and I was obsessed with role-playing games because I only played by myself at the time because multiplayer games gave me, like, a weird anxiety. I had run out of RPGs to play. I played everything at the time, completely drained it out. I had I had 100% I had played through Dragon Age Origins, even. So I, I was, like, in GameStop, and I, you know, I asked this guy, what's a good multiplayer game? He's like, oh, this is a good RPG. It's kind of similar to Oblivion. So I bring this game home, and in the first cutscene, my game breaks, and I can't even play it anymore because it's glitched on this character's sister walking into a wall going, ah, 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 for like 20 minutes, so I can't even play the game. Come to learn a few years later, it was a glitch. The developer said, oh, we don't need to fix it because it only happens one in every 25 playthroughs. One in every 25 playthroughs. Well, let me tell you, I was the one in that game sucks i see you have a very uh, strong reaction to this game i have a, a similar story of a game that i had for the original xbox and it was the hobbit 
Oh boy. Uh, I I had just read the book. I'd fallen in love with the Hobbit, and it was the opening, like you know, backstory cutscene that cinematic that was playing through, and it got froze on you know as it's reading the dialogue. Yeah. I don't remember the whole sentence. I just remember it would get frozen on the words "invited to tea," and then it would re- <laughs> it would sit there and continually repeat to tea. Two T, two T, but it wouldn't move any further. I left the game on, went outside, came back. It was still frozen. So I took it back to wherever I got it. I don't remember exactly where I got it. I mean, I was a little probably, kid at the time. Probably eBay games. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I went back, and you know, I explained the issue that I was having, and the guy said, "Well, that's really weird." And he plugs it, and he put it into his Xbox, and it worked just fine in the store. And he was like, well, what I'll do is I'll exchange it for you, you know, because I'm a little kid on the verge of tears because I love The Hobbit. It was such a good <laughs> book. Like, I just want to play this game, man. So he I goes, just and, play you know, my fucking Hobbit game, he, man. It's all yeah, I want. He, he felt bad or something. He exchanged the game for me. And I was, you know, elated. Came home, plugged it in. Got frozen on 2T, 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 all over again. And I don't know, like, I was so heartbroken as a child. Like, as far as video games go, like, in my childhood. Yeah, it was awful. And I, to this day, I never played the game just because it was, it, it was so soul crushing for me to just get stuck on that cutscene, that little cinematic right at the beginning. And, all I would hear is 2T, 2T, and it still haunts me in my dreams to this day. Like, something goes wrong, and off in the distance, I just hear 2T, 2T, 2T. Smite releases season 5, 2T, 2T, 2T. Yeah, like, it's, it's uh, oh, every time I just, I, I get brought back to that whenever a game bugs out. You know, I had Borderlands bug out the other day, and granted, I fixed it, it wasn't a big deal, but like, that's what I thought of was the time as a kid when I bought The Hobbit and it just got frozen on that cinematic on two separate copies. <laughs> oh man. What about you, Moscrow? Do you have a most hated game? Well, oh, actually. <laughs> oh man, he's been holding this for a while. You know, I can, I can well. sense the neckbeards sprouting out ready to attack. <laughs> <laughs> okay, first off, I hate ripoff games. Oh, I shit. really, really do. It aggravates me so much. So when you say ripoff games, do you mean like uh, like like copycat kind of games? Yes. Okay. Like like for example, have you ever heard of the game Trove? Like this isn't the game, but yeah. Have you yeah. heard of Trove? I, yeah, I played it. Trove is basically wannabe Minecraft. But <laughs> the game that I currently had the most distaste for is something a lot of people happen to like. I really, 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 really do not like Fortnite at all. Before you unfollow, the stream does not represent and trust in Moscow's (laughs) views and values. Continue. (laughs) But I mean, (laughs) that game just seems so vapid to me. It doesn't mean anything, really, to me. Like, okay. I was going to say, well, elaborate on that. Because, I mean,. Battle Royales aren't a new thing. Fortnite is a new style of Battle Royale, but they've only just gotten popular, but they definitely have been a staple for a hot minute. Okay, look, Battle Royale games is fine. That makes sense to me, but all you can do in Fortnite, you can build some stuff, like very basic structures that don't really... Like, they mean a lot in the game, because that's how the game's balanced and everything, but they don't... It's boring to build stuff. doesn't really have any oomph to it. The gunplay is mediocre at best. I honestly think the game is trash. Really. I really do. That's a hard word for the most popular like, game on Twitch right now. Have you heard that it's the... Um, I know you don't listen to my podcast. It hurts, but it's okay. Fortnite is now the most concurrently played game on Steam. It passed PUBG. It's the most concurrently played game of all time. Like, I mean, that's all fine and well, but I mean, it's still... Fortnite was originally supposed to be basically a PvE co-op experience, but then they saw PUBG was doing well, and they just ripped off in, like, a half way well, to make this so, game sort mode. of. There was a concept for a Battle Royale. If you look into it a little bit and you deep dive a little bit, you'll find that they did have, like, 
pre-alpha footage of a game that it was kind of like more of a battle royale pvp within the pve elements so it looked a little different and played a little different but they definitely did adapt to what PUBG was doing based off of the other games that came before it i would say they adapted but i wouldn't say that they did you know a, a paladin's overwatch sort of thing either but the thing is is like okay you have PUBG. that game is i'm not gonna say it's really complicated per se but, like, you know, you can get body armor, you can get a backpack, you can all get sorts of little things like that that'll help you. You can get in a car, you can drive the car around. Like, there's some other Battle Royale game, I can't remember what it was. It was something where you're dropped down in the jungle, and you uh-huh. have to go around and, and root through, like, these old catacombs and stuff. And But there's, like, other zombies everywhere and different stuff like that. That looks entertaining to me, but Fortnite just seems to me is, like, crappy graphics with gunplay that's as good as any other game. And it's just so basic and mind-numbing to me. It could be so much more, but it just isn't. Now, when you say it could be so much more, but it isn't, do you mean Battle Royale as a game genre could be much more? Or do you mean Fortnite Um, specifically could be much more? um, No, Battle Royale is a great concept. Like, it makes a lot of sense. Well, the only reason I say that is because Fortnite innovated Battle Royales by a lot in comparison to H1Z1, DayZ, and um, Player Unknowns. I mean, those games, and I, I like them a lot. It just isn't me bashing them. But in in that particular style of Battle Royale games, it's, you know, strategy, it's gun skill, and it, the games take longer, and there's more time to them. And Fortnite really did that a lot with the with uh, building and the way their guns play and how their gunplay is and sticking third person only. And especially with having unique game modes, I think the unique game mode thing is a new one too. So they are innovating, to be fair. It's fine and well for other people, you know, if they enjoy it, you know. Oh, yeah. But, I mean, I just have nothing really that great to say about it. It's stupid basic. It Again, I just don't feel like it does anything interesting with itself that other Battle Royales can do. At all, really, to be honest. Now, do you think if PUBG added building mechanics like Fortnite, it'd be better because you think PUBG is a better battle royale or would it be worse and more mind-numbingly easy like Fortnite is with building? Well, first off, like the building mechanic is a good idea. The way that Fortnite implements it, I don't like. It's okay in Fortnite. So what kind of building would you want it to have? Like a Minecraft style or and that, and that isn't a joke. That's that's genuine. Like I want it to be more complex than you just set up a wall and what happens is is you just aim where your wall's supposed to be and right. just build itself. Okay. It's also stupid to me how like the way most fights on open plane works is immediately they will just start building walls around themselves. Which is the dumbest thing I have ever seen. That's stupid to me. And I have seen some cool things happen from it. From the few, a few games I've played, I remember one game I was playing with you and Scott, actually, where they had this big fortress built at the end. That was a really cool concept. But I just don't like how it just all builds itself, how it just feels so... Like, I feel like one thing I don't like about it, it, it is very, very, very fast, so that's why I don't feel like I get any meaning out of it. Mm, okay, so you, you feel like because the games move so fast, it's kind of hard to really learn and get better be- because you're just in it for so short if you're not good and the good players... Oh, no, 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 I'm going to tell you, like, I suck at that game. I'm oh, no, I know you do. I've watched. I'm not saying that, though. Oh yeah, but you, like, you two are worse than me, and I'm pretty bad. <laughs> Do you have anything to interject in here, Scott? You, you play this game a lot too. Not too much. I I can see how he doesn't like the game and like areas where they can do better. But I do also want to say that like that Epic is doing a great job of monitoring their community and releasing patches to help better the game oh, yeah. as a whole. I, I feel like they learned a lesson from Paragon too. Yeah, and balance mm-hmm. patches are a really great thing to have, and I think that that's a really good thing that Fortnite is doing well. And you got to remember like this game isn't old by any stretch of the imagination. I remember, you know, downloading it when it first came to PlayStation because Queenslander, a friend of mine and I were playing a lot of Dungeon Defenders 2. And this game was supposed to be very similar, which the PvE, to an extent, is, you know, just a horde defense kind of game. Yeah. You know, I, that was about the time that I disappeared and fell off the face of the planet, and it turned out that he had fallen in love with the Battle Royale aspect and had also beaten the PvE because that's what Queenslander does. I do enjoy that they are making patches and actively working towards bettering their game. That gives me a lot of hope for Fortnite's longevity. Yeah, I mean, even Smite, we get patches three weeks after PC, and 
Hira says it's, you know, they, and they have reasoning behind it. They say it's because, you know, Microsoft and Sony take a while to validate the patches and blah, blah, blah. But at the same time, Epic is a bigger studio, granted, but they release their patches at almost the same time, and they have to go through the same exact process as Smite does. So I, I would almost to... say that their, like, patching response is far better than Hira's, which Smite is, technically speaking, in terms of how long the games existed... It's more established than Fortnite. Obviously, scale-wise, Fortnite blows Smite out of the water. I'm not arguing that at all. I'm just saying, patch-wise, I completely agree because Fortnite's shown the hop to it, while games that have existed are still lacking behind that. You know the game Dead by Daylight? Yeah. They have synchronized PC and console patch releases. Like, there's every now and again, there's a small issue here or there. It always shows up at the exact same time. I could be wrong, also, in Smite's defense. I do believe they do source out their console patches to other companies, or another company has their dealings with the console, uh, with, you know, Sony make, and Microsoft. That, that would make a lot of sense. And I could see how that would be the cause as to why everything gets set back two weeks in Smite. The thing is, is a Dead by Daylight team, I do not remember the exact numbers, but I believe it is ran by something like, well, I think it's actually less than 500 people make up the development. Something, I want to say that it's something like 160 people develop the game for Dead by Daylight. They have synchronized patches. Now, granted, they do not have as large of a scale of an audience. Yeah. But they get patches out decently quickly. And they, again, they have everything perfectly synchronized and ready to go. Mm -hmm. I just don't understand why. Before we get too off topic, though. The sum of your defense in response to Moscow Scott was basically the game is cared about by the developers. It has longevity behind it. It's completely reasonable for him not to like it, but it's kind of hard to see the game ending soon because Epic's learned a lesson from Paragon and they're really listening to their community. I don't know so much that Paragon has much of anything to do with it as far as, you know, the success and longevity of Fortnite as much as just the overwhelming amount of support that oh, the yeah. game had already had. I think it's more maybe an internal lesson for developers, not even so much a... Well, like, I'm sure there are thing. lessons to be learned, absolutely, between what happened with Paragon and what's happening with Fortnite, but also I think that Epic realized long before they shut Paragon down that the success Fortnite was going to be having. This isn't their first rodeo, you know? They're, I mean, Definitely. They're the Gears of War developer. Like, they're... They're used to pave in the way. If you think about the two genres they were going into, you know, Battle Royales and MOBAs, like League of Legends and Dota and God forbid Smite, like they have <laughs> their chunks of the pie that Paragon was going to have a hell of a time trying to get into. Like, I mean, Smite's I can't still see having them. a hard time getting into it. Yeah, definitely. And I don't see that Paragon, while it did offer a lot, I don't think it offered enough to draw too much yeah, away that from game had what killed Smite. It never would have made it as its own. And not even Smite. I mean, Smite and Paragon are small fish in a big pond. Like it would, League of Legends and Dota are just their following is so oh, hardcore yeah. the only thing and so Smite powerful. Above water is the fact it's third person. Yeah, and you know Paragon also had the third person. They had their own mechanics and you know interesting introductions to the genre. But at the same time, like you're trying to pull people from something that they're not going to get away from. You know, if you're mm-hmm. hardcore into MOBAs and you're already playing League of Legends and Dota, everything else is going to be a second rate knockoff. Which I feel like led a lot into Fortnite's success too, because Fortnite came in as technically speaking, they were the second game of its type. Because I mean, if you really think about it. Battle Royale games have always been by player unknown. It, they've always been, hit, been his game. Fortnite was the first yeah. thing to, de- you know, go away from that style. I mean, unless the game was complete rat of course it was going to make it to an extent. It just, the level yeah, it did it, is to the credit of the developers. Yeah, it's it's a pioneer in a newer genre. League of Legends has been around for, you know, thousands of years, and the genre isn't by any means new, whereas Battle Royales, you know, is processors get stronger and you know console you know speaking in terms of consoles like as they can handle these types of games you know there's going to be more and more people that you can draw in and there will be a time soon where you know people are going to look back and say oh remember the good old days of fortnite just like they do with call of duty now 
it, it'll yeah. get to that point eventually. I just I think it'll be a while. Definitely. And, you know, being a new genre, I think it's real easy for Fortnite to have gotten in there. So I could see why they'd want to devote more effort into Fortnite as opposed to Paragon. And one of the damning things of Paragon was that it, it could always be compared to the other MOBAs. Whereas in Battle Royale goes, like, Fortnite has one other competitor, you know, more or less, yeah. where, you, you know, you yeah, play one, one or the other. Really it's not as one. though they're releasing, you know, a brand new game into a massive genre where you're like, well, Fortnite's kind of cool, but I can go play this instead, or yeah. this one, you know, if I don't like that first one. There's so few options if you really want to play a Battle Royale that Fortnite is now the way to go. Do you have any uh, like one of those. last thoughts, Mosgro, on this? With how successful it is, I believe the biggest reason why it's so successful is because it's free-to-play. There. It's on every platform, and one of the reasons why I don't like it is one of its best or best qualities for a lot of people is that it is very simple, very easy to get into. I, I can see that, especially from your perspective, Mozzie, because you like the lore and the thought processes and games that make you think and whatnot. And Fortnite, you know, while it is a fun multiplayer game, there's no lore. I mean, you know, if you play the story, there is a little bit of lore, but it's not like there's some crazy thought, like, you know, when you're talking about immortality, like, there's no philosophical debates going on in your head as you're playing the game, like, should I kill this guy? Should I let him live? There's no real major consequences to any of your choices aside from, well, if I shoot this guy, someone else is going to know where I'm at. Yeah, basically. That's one thing is uh, H1Z1, that's the game where you were basically in a zombie apocalypse situation and it was multiplayer along a map, um, right? H1Z1 and DayZ were both like that, but they're basically the same thing. They had the same developer. That makes sense to me because everything feels a lot more earned. You feel like you really get something out of it. You feel like you have to work to do something. I guess my biggest reason I don't like it is because it's fast-paced. It doesn't feel like anything is worth anything. You heard it here first. Moss Girl likes it slow and steady. Scott, you had a game that you wanted to talk about that you uh, that you hated. Yes, my my number one hated game, and I'll try and keep this brief. Okay, um, yeah, like the my number one game that you know I have been most disappointed in and. You know, hate is, like, a really strong word. I can't hate the game, but I'm very, you know, I'll never play it. I I don't have anything good to say about it. Um, It was Destiny. I mean, it was such a disappointing game to me. And to go back, you know, you guys won't know this, but, you know, the guy who got me into Diablo does and my first college roommates do, I was following that game for years. Um, So it was probably... Yeah, okay. I, I was reading articles, everything about this game. It sounded amazing. You know, I was reading Game Informers. Every Game Informer I got, I was checking it for a new, oh, like, yeah. update this, on what Destiny was going to be. That it was going to be the great... It was. It, they built that game up like it was going to be the last game you ever had to play. It was insane. Yeah, exactly. And they were talking about Bungie. And, like, they put Bungie on a pedestal. Like, you know, the developers of Halo and all these other you know, things and... You know, I'm like, wow, this is cool. Like, these guys are a major developer. They know what they're doing. And I remember I was working, I delivered ice at the time, and I would just be, you know, nose deep in my Game Informer between drives, just trying to, like, find out, you know, or on my phone looking up Destiny. I had posters and stuff. Like, I'm 19 years old, and I still have Destiny posters, and I got my brother all into it, and we were all so excited to play Destiny. I just remember, you know, that was the day I got my PlayStation. And oh, wow. the, I, I bought my PlayStation and Destiny the same day and uh then went i'd so i had to work with my diablo buddy and i bought his playstation for him and he just paid me back so i bought two playstations and ordered pre-ordered two destinies that were going to be released that night oh, and then boy. we went to work you? we were what's that you got really set up didn't you oh we were we were ready so we got two playstations two pre-ordered copies of destiny we were both working together that night and i was delivering pizza um and I had a delivery like that was going past GameStop, and it was probably eleven forty-five, and we closed at one. And I told him, "Hey, man, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna get in line. I'm just gonna pick these up while we're at work, you know." And he was like, "Yeah, that's fine," because we didn't know like what time the GameStop, you know, pre-order handout would end. So I got in line. You know, first I delivered the pizza, even though I, I really didn't want to. I just wanted to get in line and get the game. So I'm in line, you know, I'm wearing all my Papa John's stuff, and I have a Papa John's car parked out front with a car topper and everything. Like, <laughs> I'm here in line for Destiny, man. Like, so I get two copies of Destiny. We go back, and we're just chatting. We're all oh, jacked up. This is already up, breaking know? my heart. I know like, how this story ends. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, I bought a twelve pack of Red Bull. Oh like, god! I stopped by Walmart on another, another delivery. We were gonna, we didn't have to work. I the want next every day. single comment of this podcast to be F for respect. It was, yeah, it was gonna be beautiful. We were, oh, we were, it was gonna be romantic. It was gonna be perfect. And uh, we get home, pop our destiny in, we're ready to go, and there's a download. <laughs> like, okay, well, that kind of sucks. Whatever, you know, we're looking at a eh, half hour, whatever, you know. We'll drink some Red Bulls, like, go outside and have some beer, whatever. Pass the time. Come back in, download's done. We get into destiny. And then you yeah. realize what a horrible mistake to make. <laughs> <laughs> and honestly, we went to bed. We probably got home around 1. We probably went to bed around 3. Like, we were, it was so heartbreaking. And, you know, playing that game, I was expecting, like, because they talked about this world. Yeah, you end up on a planet. this fucking world, and you load in it, and you just hear Peter Dinklage go, Hello, ghost. Welcome to the game. Yeah, we got in. Like, even that first part, we get out, like, you know, like, we picked our classes and everything. We were gonna, this is gonna be dope. It's gonna be great. You know, let's do this. And it's okay. Character get customization and... only had fucking two options, but that's okay. We'll push past that. <laughs> Alright, the character customization's a little low, but, like, at the same time, with we, what we were expecting was, like, you you end up on this planet, right? And because everything was going to be, like, real-time, you know, like, we'd never played any MMOs prior to this or anything like that. Like, the whole planet was going to be a map, and you just discovered it as you go. And if you look back on the Game Informer articles, they talk about this. Like, there's going to be multiple planets, man. Like, there's going to be all sorts of stuff to do. And, like, Bungie was expecting Destiny to last for ten years. Like, can you imagine the amount of content that was going to be here? And there'd be random boss fights where everybody jumps into this boss fight. Like, people you don't even know, they just show up, you know, come out of the woodwork, and, like, people coming over hills and vehicles and stuff. We're gonna fight these epic monsters. And, and that's was, when Scott oh, knew was, he had fucked it was, up. Yeah, it was gonna be incredible. And then we get in, and, like, we played for a little bit, and we're, like, trying to explore this world, but we're stuck in the sandbox. And, like, you know, we go through, whatever, do our whole thing, kill the first boss, you know, we're like, you know, at some point, this world opens up, it's gotta be great, and then you end up going to another planet, and it's another sandbox, and then another (laughs) sandbox, and then, like, there's one cutscene in the game where you go, like, to some asteroid belt, and, like, you know, the whole time, that's when you met the queen, that was, like, the best cutscene in the game, and it's pointless. It was anyway. like the only cutscene in the yeah. game. Yeah, and then like the whole story was awful, and then like it turned into a grind. And like I, f- I finished the game like in a week, and I was like, "There's no way this is the end." Like, how is this the end? I just spent sixty bucks on this and bought a PlayStation. Like, you know, oh, sorry, I gotta bleep it. But anyway, like, I just bought a PlayStation. <laughs> now, like, you say you have to bleep it. <laughs> but yeah, it was it was so heartbreaking, man. Like. What what I was promised, like, I always make this comparison. I was promised four-ply toilet paper. Went to the store, picked up my toilet and paper. And you got a goddamn out, leaf. Turned out to be sandpaper. <laughs> like, that's what they gave me. Well, that was a lot of fun. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, Moscow. No problem. Thank you for having me. Yeah. I felt like that was a hesitant. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Moscow. No, no, I... <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll tell you later. But. Thanks for the biography and Wikipedia and encyclopedia about Dark Souls, Moscrow. Oh, I could have went on for hours. Oh, you don't we know, know, my friend. No, you, you don't. <laughs> no, you don't. <laughs> if you think any of my rants has ever been I'll long, just do a bonus episode that rant. I just turn my recording stuff on for Moscrow and I just Buddhist ask him this question about Dark Souls and he just talks and I go out, I have a I have a beer, I get a sandwich, I watch a movie, get some Red Bull, buy a PlayStation 4, come back, download Destiny, and Musgrove's still talking, and I gotta end it. (laughs) (laughs) I will wreck that stream. Just (laughs) wait. (laughs) And thank you, Victoria, for sitting here and tweeting. Thanks. Oh, man. Oh, wait, you're welcome. (laughs) 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 <laughs> <laughs> and thank you guys for listening if you want to check out any of their stuff you can see Victoria and her mind numbing tweets at Victoria Jane with three E's you can see Scott and his new sexy pants filled stream at Thought Caesar <laughs> and you can oh, see but... Moscrow playing some Dark Souls and just go on YouTube and I have search determined... Moscrow not Moscow we're not looking for Vladimir Putin and his nice little abs we're looking for Moscrow and his someday, Dark Souls gameplay someday Google will like Spell check to Moscow when you try to find Moscow. That should be Someday. your goal. That's my dream. That, no, no, that that's the face reveal goal. <laughs> face reveal goal right there. 
But right. thanks for sharing your spooky spice latte with me. I'm glad to have shared it with you, and I'll see you in the next spice episode. Latte.